And welcome everyone to another episode of Two Geeks and a Marketing Podcast. As always, we're here to keep you up to date with the latest news, tech, content and wisdom from the world of marketing. My co-host is a man on a mission to demystify digital marketing, the host of the Content Marketing Studio video podcast, Please welcome Mr. Pascal Fintoni. Well, thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, can I say it's a pleasure to spend more time with a man who is also on a mission to keep marketing simple, the voice of the Marketing and Finance Podcast and the host of the Roger Log video series. I give you Monsieur Roger Edwards. Pascal, let's just take a quick moment before we dive into the news to celebrate the fact that this is episode number 20. Episode number 20, that's nearly six months worth of Two Geeks and a Marketing Podcast. Yeah, and you know, saying it like this, I mean, crikey, six months, of course it doesn't feel like this at all. Um, it feels like, you know, it's been both quick and it's been thoroughly enjoyable. And I know that you now have a special plan for this uh, 20th episode of Two Geeks and Marketing Podcast. In particular, we're going to share all doing the marketing tech and apps about our production workflow for all things, you know, Two Geeks and the Marketing Podcast. Yep, so if you're looking at launching your own podcast or putting together a video show, I'm sure you'll find it really interesting as we talk you through that process. But before we get to that, we've got to dive into the news. And we begin with Spotify, who recently purchased Megaphone, a podcast advertising and publishing platform, for $235 million. This is adding to their series of acquisitions in the podcasting industry. And Pascal, TikTok will have more than 1 billion users in 2021, according to analytics firm Apple Annie. They say that based on TikTok's growth trajectory, it will hit 1.2 billion monthly active users on iOS and Android by the end of next year. Well, it's up for some and down for others. ITV is reporting a 16% drop in advertising revenue compared to 2019. This is because advertising spend is still declining due to pandemic. Google recently announced that they will end the free unlimited storage offer on Google Photos from the 21st of June 2021. While Marks & Spencer is expanding its Scan & Pay app, customers will soon be able to shop checkout free at any of its stores for goods up to £45. The UK economy grew by a record 15.5% in the third quarter, but remains 8.2% smaller than before the pandemic, according to official figures. And Burberry is singing in the rain the title of their spectacular Christmas video, featuring dancers avoiding falling chunks of ice in the streets of London. And Microsoft launches Xbox Series X with a series of global activations. For example, in London, they have this holographic monolith right there in the city. So again, lots of really interesting things going on on in the marketing world. Pascal, let me just take you back briefly to that Singing in the Rain Burberry video. Now, obviously, we're, we're heading into Christmas advert territory, and I'm already hearing some pretty lackluster reports about the John Lewis ad, although I have to say I've not seen it myself. But I quite like this Burberry ad. It, it's quite quirky. Uh, they, they're singing a, a sort of modernized, almost rap version of Singing in the Rain. But the thing that made it stand out for me is even though it's called singing in the rain there isn't any rain they're literally dancing down the street and there is these gigantic chunks of ice crashing down from the heavens and and missing them obviously or they're ducking out of the way but they're singing in the rain when it's really more like singing in the blocks of ice yeah, I think you're right. I mean, I've got to be careful. You know how much I love the original, you know, 1950s movie. Indeed, it is mentioned in many of my presentations as a kind of go-to for storytelling. But what I will say is that they pulled it off, in my view. You know, it, it's spectacular, and as in the, the storytelling, but also the the um, kind of special effects. It looks very real to me, and I know that it was meant to obviously promote the um, waterproof and water-resistant quality of the Burberry range hence the singing in the rain, but the way in which it's been kind of made, uh, it's not too Christmassy, so I think also it could last for many weeks and months ahead. Yeah, they've, they've given it that longevity factor, haven't they? And what do you think about Google? Now, everybody's been able to upload countless millions of photographs for free for all this time, 
and suddenly Google are going to presumably slap a price tag on that. Does that seem fair? You know, we've been we've been um, used to this all this time. Was it was it just a sort of great big bait thing to lure us in, and then oh, people will be just well, I've got so many photographs on Google, I'm just going to have to carry on paying for it now. I I, I was disappointed to hear the news, uh, Roger. Not just because, of course, I am like a asset holder of the Google Photos app, but it just feels like it's a decision that is contrary to their promise. Uh, I, I will remind you that every year during the Google I.O. conferences, that was almost that the, the statement of the year, we continue to support you, and this is what we're doing for you to make Google Photos almost indispensable as an app. Mm. You know, there, there were some uh, kind of AI-driven search facilities. You could also do some mini-movies and so on. And I was just thinking, well, if there was uh, Google Photos used by businesses and professionals, I could understand it, but with respect, if it's just you know, lifestyle, and photos of you know the kids, the holidays, the dogs, and the cats. It feels just a little unfair, and and the limit is is low, mm. despite what they might say mm. to all of us. You know, fifteen gigabytes uh, over a few years, you will reach that in terms of in terms of photos. So no, I'm not a big fan, and and I think that they're losing out a very very important USB. Mm. Ab- absolutely, it just seems very disingenuous. It's almost as if they've did, done it deliberately. They've let people have this and got used to it, and then they're slapping the price tag onto it. Are, are you an Xbox man, Pascal? I am a PlayStation man. <laughs> PlayStation man. Yeah. So, so these great big monoliths appearing in London don't really tickle your, tickle your fancy if, you, if you're not an Xbox No, but I, I, will, I will, however, respect the execution. It was almost like a visual art e- exhibition. Mm-hmm, uh, some mm-hmm. might say a fraction pretentious uh, to go uh-huh. for the black monolith to almost, uh, I don't know if that was the intention, but there is echoes of 2001, the Space Odyssey. But why not have a celebration? Why not actually do something a bit more visual, a bit more engaging, which I'm sure will go viral at a time where there's little to celebrate at this moment in time, you know? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, I, I don't know about you, but I'm finding myself now looking for those sort of positive messages in things. Because this this COVID crisis has gone on so long. If an advert comes out or a, an article comes out, I'm looking for it to be positive and uplifting and, and almost hopeful. You know, if there's if there's elements of negativity, I I, I tend to I tend to turn off, and and that's good. I, I hope that people will continue to create that positive content. No, absolutely. So no, thanks very much again, Roger, for. You know, summarizing all the news for this week's episode, there was everything from you know the, the early Christmas uh, adverts to new technologies, but also new customer service with uh, what we heard a moment ago with uh, Marks and Spencers. Marks and Spencers, great content, and that leads us very nicely into the content spotlight section of the show. In the content spotlight section of the show, Pascal and I bring to the table. An item of content we found during the week. So it could be a video, it could be a, a podcast, just could be an article. And the great thing is, is that we try to take each other by surprise with a piece of content that the other person hasn't seen. So, Pascal, tell me, what have you got for me this week? So this week I've got an article that was actually found by a friend of ours, Jenny Ensworth. She, as you know, works in leadership management and change management. And she shared on LinkedIn an article that kind of stayed with me. And I was so keen to bring it to the virtual table, uh, as we tend to say. So the article is called The Remote Workplace Needs Recognition Rituals Too. It was written by Net Drovak and by Ryan Pendel, both colleagues working for Gallup, the consultancy firm based in Washington, who specialize in behavior and support business leaders make decisions through analytics. And this is a very short article, but very powerful, obviously very well thought out and crafted by both Nate and Ryan. And they are looking at this sign day of, you know, when you are a team leader, but I want to extend that also when you are working for yourself, but before pandemic, we had those very kind of unplanned and very spontaneous ways to recognize others for their great work. And that would support, obviously, motivation, well-being, and the sense of belonging in the workplace. And what they're saying is, let's be very careful, all of us, now that we're working more remotely, that we don't miss out all those, on those rituals who would come to you naturally if you were back in the office or back in, obviously, in the, in the canteen or 
back near the coffee the, the coffee machine and now they're working remotely we're moving on from zoom meetings to zoom meetings we could be forgetting those little unplanned but that's, that's the key they are always unplanned thank yous unplanned you know the boss bringing in the box of donuts on a friday the unplanned you know thank you card you know all that kind of stuff is now missing and and what they're arguing is that isn't that a shame that uh, at the time where employees have truly stepped up to the mark and giving more you know to support their organization sometimes having very challenging work-life balance you know to to, to address that we are perhaps missing out on the recognition rituals and this is just a wonderful article that was published in september when it really went back to work as you remember um, um roger so i just wanted to kind of let people know that you're going to read this article in two three minutes but it's going to really remind you about you know things that you would do without thinking back in the office but because we're working remotely it may not come to mind so just be careful and bear in mind that we may be working remotely for quite some time. Indeed, for some organization, it could become the, the main way of, of functioning. Just be careful. You know, everybody needs those recognition rituals, but importantly, so do you if you work on your own. This is so, so timely, Pascal. Do you know, I think, I mean, I, I, like you, I, I've not worked for a big corporate for, for many, many years. So I'm sort of used to working at home. And, and so the, the pandemic hasn't really changed that. But I've always missed these things that you're talking about. That is the only thing that I miss about corporate. I don't miss the politics. I don't miss the bureaucracy. <laughs> I don't miss the stupid meetings. But these little recognition rituals, as you call them, are so, so important. It's that insight by the coffee machine, as you've said, the ability to wander down the corridor just to pick somebody's brain. And and again, yeah, you're absolutely right. The, the last company I worked at had this little um, ritual where if it was your birthday, you had to go out and buy cream cakes for everybody. <laughs> so it was your birthday, but you were the one buying the cream cakes. I always thought that that was a bit strange, but it was just a, r a ritual in that business. And and quite honestly, everybody on their birthday, one of the first things they did after they'd sat down and had their first coffee was go out buying boxes and boxes of cream cakes. And if you were working in a, in a big team, it was quite an expensive ritual for you to be involved with. So I, I like the, the idea of reminding people about these things pascal no thank you very much and, and i think you know part of what we should all do whether we are team leaders or work on our own why don't you spend a moment to write down on a piece of paper what rituals you would do normally you know mm. and see whether there's a way for them to be recreated i mean they were saying even you know using a mail again by sending people a, a thank you card so normally you would you know have it around the office and people would sign it around but you know make the the effort and and so I have a system, really, that is to key message, to be reminded about those important rituals. Yeah, there's something nice about going back to traditional things like that. Sending just right handwritten, handwritten card means a lot, doesn't it? It will do. So what about mm. you, Roger? What have you found this week? Okay, I'm going to talk this week, Pascal, about getting creative with virtual events. And this is an article that um, is written by... Nikki Gilliland. Now, I think Nikki's articles have come up on the show quite a few times, and it's in the e-consultancy website. Now, over the last few weeks, again, I've been involved in quite a few online events, and some of these have been really good. Some of them have had some technical issues. But you know what, Pascal? One of the things that does, does upset me a little bit is the lack of creativity that I'm seeing on a lot of these events. Now, for obvious reasons, a lot of these events are using platforms like Zoom, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. But, you know, it's just the usual talking head, slides may be coming up on the side, and, and you know, quite a flat delivery. And I'm just thinking, what can you do to just make it a little bit more exciting, to make it a little bit different? Because let's face it, all... We keep saying marketing is about standing out. And if your presentation at a virtual event is simply just you sat there reading some slides, you know, you wouldn't do that in a live environment on stage if you wanted to stand out. So why would you do it on a, on a Zoom call? Now, if you can, if you've got the budget, you can go beyond Zoom. You can look at some of the the 
online event software that we've discussed in earlier episodes of Two Geeks and a Marketing Podcast. But this article is really just highlighting a, a few brands who've really pushed the boat out when it comes to online events. Now, I'm not saying that you need to push the boat out to the extent that these brands have. And, and let's face it, they've probably spent a, a shed load of money on some of these events. But I think it's just a it's just another lesson like you've taught us about workplace rituals. This is really just a lesson to think, you know, if I'm doing a presentation, even if it is just on Zoom, how can I make it a little bit better? Can I incorporate some pre-recorded video or can I incorporate some, you know, camera angles just to make it a little bit more interesting? So I'm not going to go through all of them, Pascal, because they they give examples of about six different campaigns that have happened. but. The, the two that I am going to give a shout out, one's called Fenty Skins House Party, and they created an entire virtual house that you can go into. Now, this is a cosmetics brand, and in the real world, before COVID, a lot of cosmetics brands often launched their wares by having a, effectively a house party. The press and all the people would be invited around to an event, and you would go around the, uh, the, in the rooms in the house, and you would try out the perfume or the cosmetics, whatever it might be. And they've replicated this. So you are almost like it's a 3D. You go into the house. You can choose which rooms you go into. And obviously, you can't touch and feel and, and um, interact with real people. But they've just gone that little bit extra. You know, they could have used a Zoom type of platform but they've invented something that just looks a lot more convincing so i really enjoyed that one and we've we've also seen virtual festivals around the world there's the tomorrowland virtual festival which was effectively a real life con uh, concert where obviously they can't have people in fields watching people performing live on stage so again they've created an entire Higher virtual conference uh, uh, concert venue uh, and, and fairly fairly big league names like David Guetta and Eric Prids are actually performing on these virtual stages. And the final one, and and again, I play Fortnite, so I'm I, I, I'm going to just <laughs> shout out Fortnite. No, Fortnite is a is a battle royale type game. You know, it's a shoot 'em up. Uh, but their marketing is incredible. And what they've been doing recently is incorporating real-life events, and some of those have been concerts as well, actually into the structure of the game. And, you know, we can be so creative with all of this technology. And there's something out there for all budgets. So I'll go back to what I said at the moment. If Zoom is your preferred method of delivery of your online event, that doesn't mean it just needs to be your face and some slides. You can still play around with it and come up with something quite visually exciting. Yes, and, you know, the, the, what you're reminding us is almost, you know, all of us to give ourselves a research project, you know, researching what is possible. So f firstly, becoming curious about all the different features and the different tick boxes and bells and whistles of Zoom, because like all platforms, you know, we, we'll probably be using only a fraction of what is capable to be doing. And then really, if you think back to you and I, you know, before pandemic, we would obviously attend quite a few events, sometimes for our own professional development, but also to learn a bit more about, you know, what we call event production, you know, mm. the branding, you know, the staging, how they use, you know, and how they change the, the format to try and, of course, engage the audience. And I think there's merit for all of us, not only to be a presenter, to produce our own work, but sometimes to sit back and join the session perhaps indeed by, about a subject that is not at the core of your activities, but just to learn or to be given th that, that bit of inspiration. Yeah, ab absolutely. So, you know, we shouldn't feel constrained, even if it does feel constraining, we shouldn't feel constrained by the current environment that we live in. Let's still be creative. Even if our budget isn't massive, we can still do something that helps us to stand out. So, Another good set of content spotlights there, Pascal. Now let's move on to marketing tech and apps. Normally in the marketing tech and app section of the show, Pascal and I bring one or two apps to the table that we've discovered during the week. But as this is episode 20, 
And, was, you know, you can tell that we're really proud of getting to episode 20. <laughs> we thought we'd do something a little bit special. Now, putting together a show like Two Geeks and a Marketing Podcast does involve quite a lot of research. It involves quite a bit of technology. And we thought it'd be really nice and interesting to talk you through the process that we go through each week to put together the show. Now, don't forget, it goes out as a video episode on YouTube. It also goes out as an audio podcast on the Captivate FM podcasting platform. Uh, but there's so much more to it than just the video and the audio. We've got to research the topics and come up with the film and all of that sort of thing. So we thought we'd split this section into three. So pre-production and look at some of the apps and technology we use there, the production of the show and the apps we use, and then the post-production um, as we actually get the show out there to you, the listeners and the viewers. So, Pascal, let's have a chat first about the pre-production. Where where do the ideas that we discuss come from? So, I mean, yeah, sorry, Roger. The um, for me, uh, it it all you know arcs back to the segments. So, mm, before mm. we even started recording anything, you know, we spent quite a bit of time back and forth talking about the different segments, how we're going to break down the, the show, and then what you and I have set up really is our own trailer account. And we have essentially a board per segment. And as and when we go through our daily lives and we discover something that could be useful for the in the news or could be useful for the marketing or indeed for you know this week in history, we just drag and drop or copy and paste into Trello, which has become almost this bolt of, of, of research. And within Trello, as a reminder for you and I, but also for our audience, we have essentially our hyperlinks to our go-to websites. And those websites include things like Marketing Week, e-consultancy, which we just discussed one of the articles there. And there's all sorts of websites out there for the history part of the show. And, and uh, Trello, I have, to, I have to say, it's not something I use massively. But for this show, it's just great to have all those links in one place categorized into the sections of the show. And Pascal, you and I share the responsibility of doing the research for the news section and for the history section. So you'll do it one week and I'll do it the next week. So we, we, we effectively share that responsibility. And so it's always one week on and one week off, I guess. But having it all contained there in the sections makes it so much easier to do the research to make sure that we've got all the stuff we need once we start recording. We do. And then as a result of which we can compile the show notes. So for that, we use the OneDrive folder system. So this is the, mm -hmm. the cloud really service from Microsoft. So we have uh, folders for each episode and within each folders we have obviously subfolders for the video assets for the um, audio asset but that'll come during production but for pre-production you know each episode at its own kind of online word document where again the segments are itemized and all the news items the apps the 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 content creator shout outs everything is written which of course you come on to later on can be repurposed into the show notes for post-production yeah, absolutely. And obviously, one of the, the best parts of the show for both of us is the film <laughs> marketing part of the show. And, you know, sometimes it's quite hard for us, Pascal, to choose which film we're actually going to talk about. You and I tend to gravitate towards 1980s science fiction and, and horror and that sort of thing. And we do try very hard to make sure that it's not always a film from the 80s and it's not always science fiction. And, and we do try to come up with things that are contemporary and from the past. And the Internet Movie Database is probably the, the, the first place that we'll go to if maybe we're struggling to come up with an idea for a film, the film of the week. Yeah, I mean, I've got, essentially, we've got three methods. You know, I look at my... Um collection of dvds and blu-ray mm -hmm. covers <laughs> mm -hmm. if that doesn't work i'll go on to mdb if it doesn't work i ring you and then you know you end up having long conversations not just about the film for film marketing but essentially anything else that comes to mind yeah maybe we should record one of those conversations <laughs> one day and that could be a supplementary episode of the show <laughs> so should we, should we move on to the actual production process itself yeah pascal and and this is this is actually probably the most complicated bit, isn't it? Because we've got to record decent high quality video and decent high quality audio at the same time. Well, you and I give ourselves, as they say, where I come from, a challenge. You know, we wanted to 
essentially uh, do something a bit different to our usual content marketing. So we wanted to really increase the production value, both in terms of video and audio. We tried and we searched high and low, did, did we not, Roger, for yeah. a, a platform and an app that would do that. And so far, we, we, we're not satisfied sufficiently. So in summary, this is what happens on my side of you know, the, uh, the virtual world. I recall the screen using QuickTime Player, which creates this gigantic you know, file, but so far that's what we have to do. And I recall the audio using a platform called Audio Hijack. And at my end, I also record the video on Zoom, but the, the problem is Zoom's video recording isn't actually broadcast broadcast quality is it pascal it's uh, it, it can be as low as 360p you know when a, a hd video is 1080 so it can fall quite a lot short and that's why you're recording the screen using quicktime because we get a much better video feed from that i'll record my audio on audacity because i'm using a pc you're using a mac and obviously our friend tim who is the the man working very hard in the background to mesh all of this together effectively has to then merge that audio and that video together to make it look like a two geeks in a marketing podcast episode that's right so you know despite the fact that you know the the video file from zoom is disappointing it's a great backup it allows some time team to see you know where things are going and so on um but ultimately you know it's back to you and i wanted to do again something that was high quality and high production value and we wanted the real full HD, uh, and again, so far, th that's this has been our solution. And I think what Tim does is he takes the video and the audio, obviously works his magic to add that together so that our, our, our mouths are in sync with the audio and that sort of thing, but then he superimposes it all over. Is it an Adobe After Effects template that he's got, which is all the sort of nice 1980s neon lights and all of that? special effects going so, on. So, well, since we're talking about post-production, so for this one, it was creating just for you and I, Roger. So, mm. so Tim got inspiration from obviously something else, but because of our very, you know, clear brief and the vision we had about, you know, the neon light and the 80s and that kind of uh, lo-fi, sci-fi uh, vibe, he had to create, you know, that overlay uh, mm. himself and the way, we, you know, we are framed. Um, we, I mean, talking about obviously post-production, you know, we actually um, kind of, signed off on the trailer and of course on the segment together with the music quite early on so his role is also to you know add the music and the segments and so on so in terms of post production then we've done the recording we've got the video we've got the audio tim delivers to you a video file mm -hmm. what's the process after that so I get uh, what we call, you know, internally draft one, and mm -hmm. and I watch it again. And what is quite remarkable is uh, each time I watch, you know, an episode of Two Geeks and Marketing podcast, it's as though I'm watching it for the first time, and <laughs> because it's completely transformed. Uh, I had some time to remember what we've discussed, so I'm watching it almost as if it's the first time. And here, there's some very very minor audio corrections and video corrections that so I send notes, which which I publish again on the OneDrive folder. And then we get a final version ready to, to be published by you and I, you know, again, via WeTransfer. So this has been the platform that we use for the back and forth because, because we've gone full HD, as you mentioned a moment ago, Roger, the video files typically are just under two gigabytes. And you upload the video to YouTube. So, yeah, so, you know, I send you a link for you to do your part, but, you know, for our viewers and listeners, I take care of the video version, you take care of the audio version because you've been podcasting much longer than I have. So my work then on my side is to create the um, YouTube thumbnail using Canva. Yeah. And at the moment, I'm experimenting, as you saw, with GIFs um, as opposed to static, and we'll see wh where that takes us. Then I upload the video, I uh, upload the thumbnail, and I'm waiting for you to do your bit. Yeah. And what I then do is once I've got the video file, which comes from WeTransfer, as you say, I put that into Adobe Audition, which is predominantly a, a, an audio editing um, software platform. And, and it, it allows you to import the video, but of course, it's mainly there to look at the audio. So I import the video into Audacity, in, into Adobe Audition, 
and then I rip the audio out of that video effectively so I can focus just on the audio. And this is the only part of Two Geeks in a Marketing Podcast that you won't hear on this video version because what I do is I do a very brief vocal overview at the start of the episode, which is simply me reading out the episode title. So I'll say something like Two Geeks in a Marketing Podcast, episode 15, or whatever it might be, and then the title of the episode. And I effectively record that and then edit it over what would be the musical introduction in the video version so that people listening to it, because they can't see the collage of images of us standing on stage and doing whatever we're doing, what they get to hear is me just say what's in this episode. So that's the only part of the show which doesn't appear in the video section. And once I've recorded that, um, and I, I have to treat it to make add a bit of bass to my voice and to normalise the audio, effectively the, I then output the audio file, uh, make sure that it's level to something called 16 LUFs, which is a, as a podcast uh, audio standard. And then I upload the audio file to Captivate FM, which is our podcasting audio platform. And, and Captivate FM is beautifully simple. Once I get into, I got into the swing of this, Pascal, th this whole process takes less than 30 to 45 minutes tops from start to finish. In fact, the, 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 the longest bit is waiting for Audacity to do that normalization to 16 LUFs, to be honest. The rest of it's actually a lot easier. And I upload it to um, uh, Captivate FM, and we both set the release timer for one o'clock on the Wednesday. You do. One more thing that you do, Roger, which is very helpful, is that you edit the show notes to actually mm. suit, obviously, uh, the Captivate and YouTube platform so that it's more legible and more to the point, you know, for our viewers and, and listeners. Um, and what is interesting is, you know, I know that for some of you, you're thinking that's a lot of steps. But after a few weeks, I sometimes don't even think about it. I just do it, and it flows very, very naturally. And for you and I, Roger, we, we, we had, I would say, 80% of the, the tasks and, and steps planned. And the 20% the was something that just we went into more naturally. And the you know, division of labor, so to speak, I, I kind of almost set itself you know, very, very naturally. Yeah, and, and again, if you're listening to the show and think, and, and you know, you maybe had the intention of launching a podcast or a, a video series like this, I hope we haven't put you off <laughs> by, make, by, by making you think, my goodness, listen to how much work goes into this. Yes, there is a lot of work goes into this, but because we've got the process mapped out now and we've been doing it for 20 episodes, it, it doesn't feel like a, a big effort, Pascal, does it? Doesn't it doesn't feel like work? I mean, the, the pre-production, the research is a blast every single time. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I, tell, I have to tell you, you know, I've become so good at game shows now because of the um, <laughs> this week in history and and in the news, um, and, and also because it's a subject matter that we love. You know, the marketing, communication, and the film marketing. The, the recording uh, is a little edgy because we have a lot of things to to get right. Then we must, of course, once again thank Tim for all the hard work in the post-production side. And then really, the, the rest is a promotion and dealing with the lovely feedback and thank yous from people. So again, I tend, just because it's way it's worked and naturally, I take the lead on posting the first alert on you know, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, and Twitter. And I love the way in which you repurpose my, uh, my post by adding a little uh, one-liner at the very beginning. Yeah, yeah, I have to say, I do sometimes feel a little bit guilty about this because Pascal does most of the work on social media and then I just copy it, <laughs> paste it and add a little bit in. So uh, may maybe if there's one area where I need to step up to the mark a bit more, that, that that's probably it. So it, it, it's, I've really enjoyed talking through this today, Pascal, because again, it highlights there's so much involved, but again, it just shows that planning and a process can make things a lot easier. So shall we move on to the next section of the show, which is This Week in History? And in 1859, Charles Darwin's On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection is published. This is the famous theory that solved so many puzzles of natural science. In 1931, unnatural science, I think, 
horror film Frankenstein is released, starring Boris Karloff as the monster, directed by James Whale and based on Mary Shelley's 1818 novel Frankenstein. And in 1935, flying boat China Clipper takes off from Alameda, California, carrying 100,000 pieces of mail on the very first Trans-Pacific airmail flight. In 1961, producers Albert Broccoli and Harry Saltzman announce expansive and expensive publicity campaign to make Sean Connery a star, and of course the year after, he became James Bond. In 1963, US President John F. Kennedy is assassinated by Lee Harvey Oswald whilst riding on the open-topped motorcade in Dallas, Texas. And in 1963, the day after President Kennedy's assassination, the BBC broadcast the first episode of Doctor Who. The episode was called An Unearthly Child and it introduced William Hartnell as the first Doctor. Well, in 1969, the Apple 12 spacecraft returns to Earth, splashing down in the Pacific Ocean. On board were NASA astronaut Charles Conrad Jr., Richard F. Gordon Jr. and Alan L. Bean. And finally, Pascal, in 1983, Microsoft formally announces Windows, a graphical user interface for Microsoft's DOS-based systems. Bill Gates promises that it will be available from April 1984. However, Windows 1.0 doesn't actually ship until November 1985. Mm, I'm sure they learned important lessons about making promises. <laughs> Can I ask you, Roger, being yes. the number one Doctor Who fan, as far as uh, I know, is, is, is that important, that episode and, and Worm Hartnell? Do you know, that very first episode, The Unearthly Child, An Unearthly Child, is remarkable. It stands up today as 25 minutes of absolutely gripping television. Now, in truth, in, in the early days of Doctor Who, each episode had its own uh, title, but An Unearthly Child was effectively episode one of a four-part story. But you can really just watch An Unearthly Child on its own as a standalone episode and, and not even worry about the other three. They don't really matter. In fact, they it, they weren't even that good. Um, it wasn't until the Dalek story that came after that Doctor Who really took off. But An Unearthly Child, the production values for something as, as old as it is, you know, 50-odd years, is remarkable. And William Hartnell's performance as this sort of human-looking but obviously alien Doctor is really, really impressive. So, yeah, it started with a bang, and let's face it, it's still on screen today, 50-odd years later. Now, obviously, I don't know uh, know any as much about Doctor Who as you do. I know that you and Richard have tried you know, to convince me many times. <laughs> when I, when, in terms of Doctor Who, is that based on, on, on the book? Is it based on the novel, or is it really a creation from screenwriters and, and television producers. Yeah, do you know, um, the, the BBC wanted to create a, a family show for a Saturday evening, so they wanted to broadcast it around about 5.15, 5.30 on a Saturday. And the brief to um, the producer, who was called Verity Lambert, was to create a show which was flexible enough to be educational and, and, and engaging for both adults and children. and the the high up at the BBC, I think he was called Sidney Newman, said, but under no circumstances should there be any bug-eyed monsters in this show. So they came up with the idea of, a, of an older guy, a doctor or a professor, travelling around in a time machine, and the time machine was the shape of this police box. And the idea was that one week they'd go into the past, say to World War II or to the French Revolution or something like that, and the story would educate the children watching about the French Revolution or the First World War. And then the week after, they may go into an imaginary future and, 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 and maybe there'd be a, a, a scientific message or a global um, environmental message. Ironically, in episode five, they introduced the Daleks, which were a sort of robot type thing with an with a alien sat inside it, which absolutely broke the brief, you know, allegedly Sidney Human was apoplectic when he saw the episode with the Daleks in and he said I told you no bug-eyed monsters and he almost fired the producer for doing it 
But of course, the Daleks were the re reason why Doctor Who went absolutely mega global. And within about six months, the BBC, a lot of their revenue was coming in from Dalek toys. So it just goes to show that by going against the brief, they actually created something which has lasted for all these years. Now, thanks very much for that. You know, listen, there's a fine selection in the This Week in History, but just to close, I want to talk to you about Apollo 12. Mm. And just an observation, really, which is, you know, a part of our human trait is to always remember the first, you know, the gold medalist. No one knows about the silver or bronze and so on. And Apollo 12 is not getting the, as much coverage as Apollo 11. Now, we understand mm. that, which is why I was keen to read out the names of the astronauts. But, you know, let's be clear. The achievement is that this mission took place literally four to five months after the first one. After. It's really, really close. And they were in space longer, albeit just by two days, but it's still longer. They took more risk, and actually they brought back with them more uh, samples, you know, from the moon and so on and so forth. So I, I just feel like it's just an observation. This is the way we are, where we always seem to kind of celebrate the first and whatever. But actually, people went afterwards, achieved more. Yeah. Do you know, Pascal, it's a, it's a reminder for me as well. I didn't realize that it was so soon after the first one. If, if you'd have asked me before we did this episode, I would have probably said a year or two years between them. So that that's that's incredible. It's an achievement. And, and I do wonder, uh, obviously, perhaps we should do some research or maybe our listeners know about this, but is it because, you know, Apollo 11 was the first one, but also got extraordinary TV coverage? And perhaps Apollo 12 did not have the same level of exposure. And of course, I think it was Apollo 13, which is the one after, that got into trouble, wasn't it? And of mm. course, they made a great big film about that, and there was <laughs> all sorts of... So yeah, I think we've done our bit today to bring up the notoriety of Apollo 11 back to the forefront of the uh, the, the uh, space race. <laughs> Pascal, that was a really fun section, and uh, apologies for that, or, or thank you for giving me the opportunity to do that impromptu history of Doctor Who. Shall we move on now to the creator shout-out section? In the creator section of the show, Pascal and I bring to the table someone from our close networks, or maybe slightly outside our close networks, and give them a shout out for the content that they are creating. So, Pascal, what have you got for us this week? So, this week, thank you very much, Roger. I want to celebrate the work of Helen Reynolds. Now, Helen is the founder of Inc. Gardner Copywriting Services. Inc. as in what you need to write good content with, and of course, Gardner. So, Inc. Gardner Copywriting Services. She has this wonderful statement that says that a website is like a gardener. And she's here to help you plant Google-friendly copy. She can also tend to your social media networks, and she can sew your blog. And she's using this kind of analogy of gardening superbly across her website. She's here to help profit bloom through fresh words. A passion of copywriting that she's found pretty much since 1997, it didn't even earlier. She's based in York and is supporting companies across the UK. And I wanted to kind of brought to your attention, Roger, her blog she's going for blog series. And you know what, what a fan I am of people doing series. So you have things like website tips, you have business writing, Twitter tips, Facebook page know-how, and lessons from a small business owner. And in there, you're going to find some remarkable practical advice about copyright, but also what she understands about, you know, engaging an audience using good copy. And, and again, something that she's truly passionate about. In fact, if you go on her website, Roger, you'll see a picture of her holding a little sign saying, hashtag, I love my job. <laughs> so <laughs> I thought we should, you know, really celebrate th that work with her. Uh, I just like, you know, the way she's approached her work to date with her client, but also the way she's bringing value through the blog but also using blog series and i'm a big fan so you can find more about it if you go to inkgardener.co.uk and that's helen reynolds who's the founder of ink gardener copywriting so this week pascal i'd like to shout out cole gray now not to be confused with colin gray who you gave a shout out a few weeks ago he's the podcasting guy cole gray is a graphic designer and brand expert now i saw cole do a presentation about brand development at a conference a few years ago. Now, I've seen brand presentations given by global agencies like Interbrand uh, and that sort of thing. And 
Col Gray absolutely nailed it. It was the most well researched and well delivered and easy to understand branding presentation I've ever seen. And I really, really enjoy the way he explains branding. But he's also a really good graphic designer. So when I finally got my book launched and got it finished and got it written, Col was the natural person for me to ask to do the cover of my book. Now, for those of you listening to the audio version of the podcast, you won't be able to see this, but I'm just holding up my book cover now. Uh, and, and you can just see the book's called Cats, Mats and Marketing Plans. And Col came up with this amazing graphic for me of the cat sitting on the magenta mat. I was specifically um, wanting the mat to be magenta. Now, he was he's, he's so good and so perceptive I briefed him as to what I wanted, and he almost nailed it on the first go. There was very little that I wanted to change. He also runs a YouTube channel. It's called Pixels Inc., and he's got about um, 25,000, maybe more subscribers now. And again, he does brand explainer videos, graphic design explainer videos, and they're really engaging and really interesting, and you really do need to check it out. And if you've got any graphic design work that you need doing, you really need to get in touch with Cole Gray. So we'll put the link, as always, in the show notes, but check out Cole's work. That's smashing. So two people passionate about, you know, the way in which they've appro- they are approaching content creation. Helen Reynolds and Cole Gray, thank you very much, Roger. So, Pascal, it's time. It's time for film marketing. This week's film is a horror film, and it's a horror film that stands out for one reason only. In the entire length of the film, there's only five minutes of dialogue. It is called A Quiet Place. Great film, Pascal. What do you think? Ev, it is an outstanding film. I've never been so terrifiedly quiet (laughs) <laughs> in, our, in my entire existence. I mean, you're right, you know, this movie, particularly because of the silence, but also the, the soundscape, you're drawn into it. And I don't remember even just moving or breathing throughout the whole movie. I think the breathing thing was what I re- remember most about it. Because you're right, it's so it's so quiet, and yet they do amplify any sounds that there are. So, you know, standing on a leaf and it crunches... You know, the, the the sound production in the film is incredible. And I did find myself sitting there getting out of breath because I was almost <laughs> on the edge of my seat forgetting to breathe. Now, this is tricky because uh, we may have some viewers and listeners who have not seen The Quiet Place. And mm. my goodness, you guys are in for a treat. So we're mm. going to try and not review the film the marketing element with, um, with, with spoilers. We're going to try and mm. be very careful. But in mm. general, you need to know that this is a film that takes place, interestingly, in 2020 which at the time was the future because this film came out in 2018. And it follows the story of the Abbott family trying to stay alive after most of the population in the world has been slaughtered by an alien species with hypersensitive hearing. And of course, the only way that you can avoid being attacked and killed by these horrible monsters is to stay very quiet. You know, even speaking making a noise, knocking over a glass or something like that is enough to get them running towards you for miles and miles and miles away. And and it's that that is the hook of the film. And that that isn't going to ruin the film for you. It's how they get round that terrifying concept that makes the film so amazingly entertaining and scary. It is. And I'm going to actually take out an element because it's going to spoil it for you. But you need to know that one of the reasons this movie is also gripping is that the mother is pregnant and is about to give birth. And the whole story is about the family survivor, but also how will she give birth in complete silence with those alien kind of gravitating towards the farm where they are kind of hiding. And what do babies do, Pascal? <laughs> they, well, you can you can work it out. You can work it out. It is it is edge of the seat stuff, you know. As I wasn't I wasn't joking about holding my breath. It is one of those films which you genuinely get sucked into the reality. You know, it's such a it's an alien concept, but the reality they they put it across so well. And again, as you say, the production of the sounds in the film just makes it so real 
and so terrifying. Absolutely. So, I mean, this movie premiered in April 2018, was released soon after. Uh, interestingly, some, some countries had to wait a very long time. Um, Japan, for example, had to wait till September 2018, almost, you know, um, you know, an entire uh, half a year. But the success of the film, again, for those of you who haven't seen it, you know, just to let you know that this film was chosen as a, one of the top 10 films of the year in 2018, by the American Film Institute, and there was some fierce competition at the time. So much so that um, A Quiet Place Part 2 has been filmed and produced, was due to be released in March 2020. Uh, we know what happened then, so it's been pushed till April 2021 for now. And hopefully it will get launched in 2021. I'm not going to go into another tirade about <laughs> studios delaying launches, but uh, this is one of the ones up there on the list with... No Time to Die, the, the the new James Bond film. I just wish they would get it out there on demand so we can watch it now. No, absolutely. So let's begin uh, to talk about the marketing element yeah. of The Quiet yeah. Play, if you don't mind, Roger. I'll begin by reminding you that the trailer was released actually quite early on in November mm -hmm. 2017. But I remember the release was, you know, much some months ago. And there was some very brave decision taken by the production and marketing team, which is we're not going to show the aliens at mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. And the trailer would have no sound either. I mean, that's so good, isn't it? You know, we said earlier when I was doing the content spotlight um, section that you really need to see if you can stand out when you're doing a virtual event. You know, it, it t probably took guts to put out a trailer with no sound because the natural reaction of people would probably be to bang their computer or shake their phone and think there's something wrong with the sound here but that's part of the whole pro that's part of the whole appeal isn't it yeah and the the trailer um, which is actually just over two minute mark showing scenes of survival in complete silence mm. really drawing the audience in thinking what are they doing why that's mm. the important thing is it was a why mm. and then it closes with a sentence silence is survival wow <laughs> silence is survival and and I think they they actually aired that again, didn't they, during a Super Bowl in February two thousand and eighteen, with an audience of hundred million people. They put an advert out that was totally silent. Yeah, I mean that's incredible because you know before and after, I would imagine there'd be all kind of noise and explosions and running and screaming and whatever to entice yeah. the audience to go in, and then this one comes along and this silent. Absolutely, I mean I'd love to actually see the footage of that stadium when they did that you know <laughs> did did everybody all, all of a sudden quiet and write down and sort of did the hush descend over the st that would have been incredible if that's what actually happened well i'd imagine some of them thought maybe the audio was broken yeah, or if someone yeah. had messed up you know but um yeah. soon after the only poster, which I think is also another brave decision, there was only one official poster was released, actually showing you know Emily Blunt, who played obviously the, the mother in the film, in the bathtub. You'll know why uh, if you watch the movie. She goes in a black. There's a very kind of foreboding shadow, you know, coming through uh, one of the corridors. But the only text you see on the poster is as follows: "If they hear you, they hunt you." That's it. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And uh, I mean, it's, it's a great poster, actually. It is, you know, it's, it, it, it sums everything up and you've got that tantalizing glimpse of the alien with the shadow that it casts on the wall. And, and then there were, there were more trailers that sneaked out little bits of extra information. Um, you know, the, one of the trailers was a news report about the devastating invasion um, then you get that tantalising glimpse of the fact that um, Emily Blunt's character, as you said, was nine months pregnant, uh, prompting that immediate question, how on earth is she going to give birth silently? Um, oh, in incredible the way they just drip fed little snippets out there. And, and what they did very cleverly is that they created more why and how then, you know, how mm -hmm. will she give birth silently? Why are they here? You know, all those wonderful things. And then they continue to kind of tease the audience with some social media kind of uh, version of the uh, kind of mini trailers, if you will, Roger. And those were introduced by having a sound wave on the screen mm. almost as the opening sequence and then the sound wave would fade out to reveal a silent scene of the family surviving yeah 
and there was that sort of thing on Facebook where you had to press and hold it on on the mobile to see it like it was like a red button you had to press and hold to watch those tension filled scenes and and this the, this the other one they did which was absolute genius was <laughs> yes. on Instagram you know most most of us have the sound uh, muted on our phones and so quite a lot of what people do on Instagram and Twitter and everything is to say sound on if they want people to actually listen to a video or listen to a story but what they actually did here was actually tell you to s- turn your sound off which again was totally the opposite of what you would expect so another great piece of uh, of teasing marketing there and what i like is that you know they, they created this tagline you know if they hear you they hunt you and they squeeze value out of it and it's back to some of the comments we make you and i roger which is if something is working just make it work harder for you don't invent something new so building i think on the success of facebook and instagram they went ahead and created an app where you mm-hmm. could download the app and actually monitor how noisy you might be or how noisy your environment is, and depending on the level of noise, you got safe or hunted as a message on your phone. <laughs> so then you could have fun with your friends by maybe walking across, you know, the courtyard, or maybe going to the office, or being in your house. But you know, are you quiet enough to not be hunted by the aliens? Yeah, I mean that that's genius, isn't it? And again, so on brand and so on plot, I guess. You could say, and it, it just sucks people into how the how the movie operates. That they, they really they really did some impressive stuff with this film. Yeah, man. So so really, there was a proper kind of audience engagement uh, to the mm-hmm. point where, in a way, the kind of uh, for, formal media you could call it um, didn't really take the bait. It took a very long time for the press and radio and TV to uh, essentially ask questions about the film because, of course, horror as a genre is not deemed to be worthy of the attention of you know the media. But once uh, all this was out, and once it was known that you know. John Krakinski, excuse me to for butchering his name, and Emily <laughs> Blunt um, were both to beginning with a couple, not a couple, but also the director, producers, and the actors and performers of the film. Then suddenly the interviews came flowing in. Yeah, absolutely, and, and and a lot of the interviews did focus on the sound design, as you would expect, because that's what is one of the most impressive parts of the movie. It's it's definitely a film to be listened to. Despite the fact that it's called a quiet place, it's a movie to be listened to. So, what were the what were the takings like, Pascal? Was it a success? Yes. Uh, now, what is interesting in the horror genre, um, there is almost a formula which is you do most of your takings and most of your revenue in that f- opening weekend. And then after that, audiences get bored or they'll wait much, much later. This movie was essentially viewed and you know, and appreciated for four weekends in a row. As a result of which, then the media had a second kind of craze. So you had a situation where the uh, the director, I'm going to try and pronounce his name probably now, John Krasinski, that's it, mm. was mm. interviewed to even de- do a breakdown of scenes. So you had maybe the trailer, you had a scene in the film that people have seen before, but then he was interviewed to explain how he filmed it and so on and so forth. So so I think um, to the point where people are saying, well, maybe it's not just a horror film, maybe it's a thriller, you know, and I can think because they wanted to try and leg- legitimize uh, the film because horror film is not meant to do that well. Mm. And it was the best opening weekend in history for an original screenplay <laughs> horror movie, wasn't it? Um, I, I, again, I one of the things that I do remember vividly when i first watched this what once we got beyond the sound and all of that sort of thing was i thought the monsters were actually quite well designed and quite well realized you know in the age of cgi it it's maybe it's quite easy to create a monster and sometimes it's so easy that they just they just either look like cartoons and they they don't actually get superimposed into the film properly and it looks like they're floating or something but these these things were genuinely frightening and that noise they make so sort of crackling <laughs> noise like that again spine chilling stuff spine chilling stuff so i really really can't wait to see quiet place 2 i i'd be really interesting to see you know what how they take this idea further and tease our senses even more and i guess the biggest marketing lesson here again it goes back to what we were saying earlier about doing something different to stand out at a virtual conference 
they did something different. They created almost an entire new genre here. There's been a few films after which have played with the concept a bit, uh, but this one, it took a risk, and the risk paid off. And again, you know, please to our viewers and listeners who have not seen the film yet, it is really, really well crafted as a story. You know, you're going to fall yeah. in love with the characters pretty much, you know, from the get go. You're going to root for them. You're going to fear for them, and you're going to keep wondering how are they going to make, you know, it, and how they're going to survive. How they're going to be able to give birth to the baby. How they're going to be able to find food. And and I think this kind of survival story is always very, very uh, attractive because you put yourself in in their place. So I don't know about you, Roger, but I kept thinking, well, what would I do? You know, how would I survive yeah. this? Yeah, absolutely, and. One of the things that I liked, and we, you picked this up, is that Stephen King, who is the world's greatest living horror writer, isn't he? He's written so many books and had so many films made of his books. But he said in a tweet, A Quiet Place is an extraordinary piece of work, terrific acting, but the main thing is the silence and how it makes the camera's eye open wide in a way few movies manage. And I think that that is where we should leave our discussion of a quiet place. And we now, should I am just tem- part of it very quietly. Yes, <laughs> I am tempted. I am tempted just to leave it now, and let the rest of the podcast be just silence. But I'd like to thank everybody for coming along and either watching the show or listening to the show. We really do appreciate you taking the time to watch or listen to us please do leave us some comments wherever it is that you consume this podcast audio or video leave us a comment ask us questions give us suggestions for films you'd like us to talk about content you'd like us to review and do please give us your feedback on the show thank you for watching two geeks in the marketing podcast and until next time Go out there and make sure that your marketing is done right. As always, I was Roger Edwards and he was Pascal Fintoni.